This is Faith in Action, the program that looks at how people put their faith into action in their everyday lives. Faith in Action is a production of Catholic Radio Indy. Now here's today's program. This is Faith in Action on Catholic Radio. I'm Jim Ganley. Our co-host is Bridget Ayer. Hello, hello. Good to be with you. And New Year getting off to a pretty good start? Yeah, it really is. I mean, I haven't made any resolutions. I said that the last show we did. <laughs> I'm still working on those. You know, I think for most years, it's like birthdays. You know, you don't feel a whole lot different one day than you do the next day. But I think with 2020, I think that's going to be a really good year <laughs> to see in the rear view mirror. Goodbye 2020, right? <laughs> and uh, if it never happens again exactly like that, it'll be good. I don't think it's ever going to happen exactly like that again. And so hopefully that- we're on some uh, positive things as far as the virus goes and moving down the right trail. Absolutely. Well, um, if you didn't know, January is actually recognized as Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And in light of that, we're going to be talking with our guest, Simona Rising, who serves as the anti-human trafficking on the ant i can't talk on the anti-human trafficking task force in the office of social concerns for catholic charities here in the archdiocese of indianapolis so we hope to cover how to recognize human trafficking and how parents and caregivers um, can work to prevent it so welcome to faith in action simona thank you so much i'm so excited to be here with you guys now now, now simona i i just uh, noticed the uh office i i i guess i don't know all of the offices at the uh, Catholic Center downtown, but the Office of Social Concerns. Is that a new uh, office, or has that been there a long time? It's actually been there. I think Teresa Chambly has been at the Archdiocese. She's about 10 years, and she, um, yeah, she heads that department, and we have been around for a while. So we kind of cover so many different departments, and the human trafficking it's kind of just one department that she is over. There's a kind of an umbrella of social justice, I would say, um, through the archdiocese. And so there are a lot of things that are covered under that umbrella. Now, with social concerns as part of your um, office, or part of your title there and your duties there, does that change over time? Or do we have pretty much the same social concerns that we've always had? You know, it's changed so much, I think, because of COVID. Um, I came on as the care coordinator, and CARE is Catholic Accompaniment and Reflection Experience Program, and so that really deals with working with our undocumented brothers and sisters. Um, And so it's exciting to see kind of how it's expanding and growing, and based on just kind of what's happening out there in society and based on the political scene and different things like that, we're adjusting, and we recognize that, you know, um, social justice is not static, and so we want to reciprocate the needs and see what's out there and, and meet those needs for the parishes and also for the communities they're serving. So we're really dynamic. Um, I think social concerns is starting to just adjust to see, you know, what the need is and, and try to meet those needs as an archdiocese. And I think in general, the church is like that, you know, with the Holy Spirit kind of leading the way that, you know, various orders have come and gone to meet the various needs of the community or the society at that time, if you kind of look historically. So that's, you're kind of doing kind of the same thing and in, in, in being dynamic and able to adjust to whatever the need is. I want to talk um, about how you would define human trafficking and then what is your involvement? I know you have kind of an interesting um, background for this topic. So talk about what it is, how to define it, and then maybe how you got involved with human trafficking. Sure, I'd love to. Um, I'll kind of give you the broad overview of human trafficking. Sure. um, And then we'll kind of dig into a little bit my background and just kind of even just a little bit more about like the different types. There's different types of human trafficking. So when Mm -hmm. we talk about just human trafficking in general, um, one definition that I really like is the business of stealing freedom for profit. Um, So in some cases, traffickers trick, defraud, or physically force victims into selling sex. And then in other instances, victims are lied to, assaulted, threatened, or manipulated into working under inhumane, illegal, or otherwise just unacceptable conditions. Um, it's a pretty, it's pretty big, <laughs> big, big dollar industry, criminal industry that denies freedom to 24.9 million people around the world. Um, but when we talk about human trafficking, we want to be really careful that there's sex trafficking and then there's labor trafficking. Okay. And sex trafficking is using force, fraud, or coercion to induce another individual to sell sex. Well, labor trafficking is the crime of using force, fraud, or coercion to induce another individual to work or provide services. Um, so 
we just want to, you know, we want to make sure that those, those both categories, and sometimes it's both, and sometimes it can just be one or the other. And I'm curious, is, is which, which area is, is bigger worldwide? I'm curious about that. Which That's type? a great question. So actually you know? worldwide, ex- yeah, experts actually believe there are more situations of labor trafficking than sex trafficking, but in the U.S., there is a much wider awareness of sex trafficking. So oh, okay. kind of interesting to note that, yeah. All right. Um, now tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this area. Well, my background in this kind of started way back. I worked at the Public Defender Agency here in Marion County, and we were kind of seeing women coming in um, suspected of trafficking, and that's really where my interest and passion around this area grew. And I connected with Tracy McDaniel, who was the founder and CEO of Restored, and Restored worked with um, juvenile survivors and children who had been um, part of the commercial sexual exploitation and really got involved there and worked there for a time with survivors. We worked with juveniles specifically, but, you know, there can also be adult victims of this crime as well. And so just kind of from there, learning so much from the survivors, learning so much um, about this industry and how many people it actually touches and how vulnerable our youth are, and kind of my passions just grew from there. And so when Teresa asked me to be part of this anti-human trafficking committee, I was like, of course, I would love to, you know, come over and bring my expertise. And she's done a lot. This is a passion of hers as well. And so she's done so much just in terms of trying to bring this issue to light and then making it available to parishes so the parishes can start combating this as well. We're talking with Simona Rising. She is the Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force member for the Office of Social Concerns for Catholic Charities here in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And I want to talk about the um, what does the what does the Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force do? What do they try to accomplish or make? How is the local church involved in this area? We really, as a task force, are really committed to advocacy, education, awareness. So we realize that as an archdiocese, we can't reach everyone. Um, And I think the best way to do this is for parishes to become involved, to become aware of what's happening. So we have a toolkit on our website, actually, if parishes are interested in getting involved. And as a task force, we are more than willing to come out to parishes to speak, um, to small groups, whoever is interested in learning more. We also, last year, were able to put on a community presentation, just a kind of a human trafficking 101, and that's something that we're hoping to do again in the new year, just to kind of spread awareness, share information for parents about their kids, about caregivers, about anyone in the church who's working with children. I think we're all responsible for taking care of our children, and so certainly we all want to become aware of the spread flags and some of the vulnerabilities that our children have to be able to protect them. Sure. What uh, You mentioned parish involvement. What kind of involvement would you be looking for from a parish? You know, I think parishes, there are things that they can do as individuals, and then there's things that they can do as groups. So as individuals, I think, you know, really trying to combat this culture of, um, you know, exploitation and human trafficking, being a responsible consumer, um, if you're a business owner or, you know, an employer, being responsible, buying ethically made products, so fair trade products, committing to not participating in this commercial sex industry, Um, cultural change, you know, that can look like a parish group doing a fundraiser to raise awareness, but also to raise funds for these groups that are um, working for this cause. You can also, there's so many different um, walks that you can take part in, just again, to raise awareness and to, you know, just bring this attention to light. I think also youth ministry is a great way to spread awareness. So whether it's getting your youth ministers involved and then educating your young people about online safety. Um, That's something right now with the virtual world that's so prevalent. We see just an uptick in human trafficking through social media, through um, online gaming, through this kind of virtual world that traffickers kind of now have this open door to our young people. And that's, and that's, And and that's really ramped up too, like since COVID, you know, because when things were shut down, you know, the parents that had media rules <laughs> that kind of went out the door, you know, it's like, ah, oh, well, you got to ha- be on there for school. And if you want to talk to your friends, I mean, it's like kind of the only way. And so I think the, the rules were relaxed for some parents and that could have been, you know, opportunity for access, you know, for absolutely. this type of issue, but go on, go on with what you were saying, yeah, Simona. Absolutely. You know, I was just saying like, 
really the biggest thing you can do is to educate yourself. Um, and for parishes especially, I think just bringing this to as many people as you can, raising the awareness level, because once we have this information, I think we're all compelled to do something about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and whether that's, you know, educating someone else that we know or um, educating a young person or just saying to a young person in your life, you know, you can come talk to me. If there's something that makes you uncomfortable, mm-hmm. if there's something you're not sure of, I am someone you can trust. I am someone that you can talk to. I'm going to maintain that safe space for you. Yeah. Um, and that's just really important right now. Like, Bridget, what you're saying is so spot on about, you know, just, yeah, this virtual world is just opening up so many doors. And I think as parents, we have to be really vigilant. You know, we are the first line of defense and teaching our kids about online safety and um, making sure that we are there rules around, you know, what time does the Internet go off in your house or are there certain areas? Like maybe they can't have their iPad or their phone in their room with the door closed. Like maybe the door has to be open or you have to be out in a communal space where I can kind of look over your shoulder. And I'm just checking your phone randomly, um, you know, just to make sure that I know what's going on. And, and yeah, and if there's things that you notice that changes in your, in your young person, like you certainly want to be aware of those and, we know our kids best, um, so. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned uh, youth programs at uh, parishes and things like that, and I got I, I was thinking, you know, when I was a youth, uh, when I was, uh, well, most of my life, really, never heard of human trafficking, uh, at least not in the United States. That was something that happened some terrible places in the world, but not here, but now it's uh, so widespread that, for a, a youth, a teenager, to know about it is a good thing. Yeah, and and what Absolutely. and what is the scope? I guess um, you know, is it is there a problem here in Indiana? I mean, what are we talking about here? Yeah, I will say. So I pulled some statistics off the National Human Trafficking Hotline, um, which is kind of you know where we would if if you're ever suspicious of something with that, we'll talk about that a little bit. But that's really you know what your first line of defense um, and. Last year, they identified 292 victims here in Indiana. Um, they identified 67 traffickers and 29 businesses here just in Indiana alone. And I will say, Indiana, um, you know, we have kind of have this corridor in the Midwest. It's, it's pretty prevalent if you look at a, kind of a heat map of where trafficking occurs. It's pretty prevalent on either coast. And then we kind of have this, this corridor right in the middle here just because we have so many um, highways converging and there's just a lot of traffic through here in the Midwest. And so you do kind of see this rise and, you know, big events like the Super Bowl or, um, you know, some of the NASCAR and some of the IndyCar races, those are kind of big, Mm -hmm. big times as well. So you have some of those events that draw people. Um, So, yeah, so there is obviously, you know, it is happening here. It is happening all over the place. um, But Indiana is also being affected. And, you know, it happens rurally. It also happens in the city. I think it touches every demographic and, Mm -hmm no one is really immune from this. We all have vulnerabilities, and so that's what traffickers really prey on. Now, in, in labor trafficking, you mentioned um, uh, industries and things like that. Are there any particular industries that tend to have more of forced labor than other industries? There are. So there are some common ones. Um, they include agriculture, domestic work, restaurants, cleaning services, carnivals, um, like illicit massage parlors, escort services, those kinds of things mm-hmm. would be kind of where you'll see some more of that. Um, you know, sometimes, like I would say, in the restaurant industry, it could look like um, labor trafficking could, would, would look like withholding wages or bringing someone over with the promise of, you know, you can pay me back and then the person is never able to pay them back or something like that. It's, it's pretty covert, I would say. It's not necessarily you know what we would think of labor trafficking like someone's chained to something but mm-hmm. it, it it is you know like oh well i brought you here and now you owe me um mm-hmm. those kinds of things so especially for our immigrant brothers and sisters as i was just touching on yeah that's a really big one yeah and if there's a language barrier i'm sure that that plays into the inability to get free as well so on that note we need to take a quick break when we come back we're going to talk about how you can recognize human trafficking when it's happening and prevention so stay tuned for more faith in action at catholic radio we love to hear from you call us anytime just recently we found this message on our voicemail i'm a non-catholic that listens to your catholic radio station and i just want to thank you guys i listen to uh catholic answers and i'll trust this sometimes and i think her name's Teresa tommy i listen to her and uh one other show or two i appreciate it call us at 317-870-8400 and let us know what you're thinking i just called to say you know i'm not a catholic i listen to your station 
Have you ever thought about joining the Catholic Church? Have you just wanted to explore the Catholic faith? All you need to do is call your local Catholic Church for more information. We are always happy to help you in your journey to discover and learn more about the Catholic faith. We have classes that are almost year-round, and the classes and information sessions do not involve making a commitment, and there is no pressure to join. Please call your local Catholic parish for more information today and start the journey of one day possibly becoming Catholic as well. God bless. Alexa, what's the weather forecast for today? Alexa, what time is the Colts game today? Alexa, remind me to pick up the dry cleaning tomorrow. Has Alexa become a part of your daily routine? Then make sure that routine includes Alexa, play Catholic Radio Indy. Catholic Radio Indy. Quick, easy access to Catholic programming 24-7. Just say, Alexa, play Catholic Radio Indy. Catholic Radio Indy. You can hear the Holy Mass every day at 8 a.m. right here on Catholic Radio Indy. Welcome back to Faith in Action. I'm Bridget Air. Jim Ganley and I are in the studio, and we're talking with Simona Rising. She is the on the Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force for the Office of Social Concerns for Catholic Charities here in the Indianapolis Archdiocese, and we're we're talking about how um, I guess how is how does someone locally, like a local teen or person, get caught up in human trafficking how, how does that happen well you know like i mentioned earlier so vulnerabilities are really what make us all unique and also what make us really susceptible to this okay um and we all have that kind of that common need for love and belonging and so traffickers are able to prey on that you know especially for teenagers they are um going through that phase where they're separating from their parents and they're just looking for someone to connect to who understands them and so often traffickers will just say like i get you i understand you um and the grooming process is really slow and you know sometimes it's just about buying them things that they want that their parents won't buy them or something like that you know i mean they're very smart and manipulative in how they do this and so you know there are ways that you kind of can look for and there's also certain populations that are more vulnerable so you know, if you're a runaway, um, if you're involved in the juvenile justice system or foster care system, those are a lot of times youth that we see. If you have a caregiver or family member who has a substance abuse issue, I think in Indiana specifically, we have a lot of familial trafficking. Um, and that is, you know, grandma or mom um, or can be dad, you know, um, being the trafficker. It doesn't necessarily, oftentimes I think people assume it's a stranger. Mm -hmm. And that is most often not what. Mm -hmm. they, it is. It's someone close to them. It's someone that the family trusted or it's someone within the family. Um, if you have a history of sexual abuse, if there's any um, substance abuse issues or mental health concerns, oftentimes those youth can be more vulnerable and more susceptible. We talked about if they're undocumented, you know, the language barrier coupled mm -hmm. with their status, um, the kind of like not having that protected status. Mm -hmm. If there's an issue of poverty, if there's an unstable living in situation or history of domestic violence, any of those things can make, you know, someone susceptible to this. Now, now one, um, one, yeah. one thing you didn't mention um, was, like, family income. A lot of the things that you were describing sounds like those might be folks that are uh, not so well off financially and things like that. So is this something that never happens to rich people? No, that's absolutely not the case. Um, you know, I would say probably the cases that we've seen for – People who are of middle and upper middle class or even in the higher income bracket, that their youth are still susceptible because of those same vulnerabilities. So it may be that, you know, for someone who um, is in a vulnerable situation living in poverty, they're working three jobs to try to pay the bills. Well, the same can be true of, you know, parents. Um, they're working a lot. They're not around a lot emotionally. They're just not able to maybe give their youth their, that meet those needs. And so without having those needs met, those kids are looking for that love and belonging somewhere else. And it could be through friends, but, you know, it could be also with, in this virtual world, someone on social media who's like, hey, I understand you. Or, you know, someone can look at someone's Facebook feed and say like, oh, well, I really like that movie too, or I really like that music you're listening to. Kids just crave that. I mean, they're craving for that attention and acceptance. And so when someone gives that to them, you know, no matter what income bracket you're in, and then if the parents aren't paying attention, it's you know, if parents aren't keeping that dialogue open, if they're not talking with their kids, um, if they're not around to know when their kids are be being secretive or know who their friends are and who they're hanging out with, um, that can very easily lead to an exploitive situation. I mean, we 
we oftentimes see this as just an older boyfriend or girlfriend who they're bringing home, Mm -hmm. you know, and the parents are thinking, okay, it's just, they're just older, it's okay, well, maybe it is, but maybe it's not, you know, and, and only you know, you know your kids the best, you know, so making sure that they know that they can come to you and that you're a safe person or they have a trusted adult that can, can come to you because certainly this, this is not just for those in poverty or those that are in the lower, you know, economic. So what should parents or any anyone that's listening to this show, I mean, you don't necessarily have to be a parent, but um, someone in the pew, I mean, is there, it, how, youth minister, how do you recognize this? And this does this only happen to young people? Or are the, is it like in kind of a target age that is typical that are being trafficked? And I guess you mentioned the vulnerabilities, but what, how can people recognize if they see something that, that looks a little bit off? Maybe they're even out to eat, you know, like out at a restaurant, like you mentioned, you know, people that are, that could be labor traffic there. What, what should people be looking for? Is there, are there some real obvious things to notice? Yeah. So you want to look for, there's a couple different things. One thing is what we call branding. So tattoos, um, with a name noticeably on the neck or on the chest area, that's kind of a common sign. Also, like, if the person just appears fearful, anxious, depressed, they avoid your eye contact. Um, if they're not able to speak for themselves or if they seem like they're being excessively controlled or monitored, like the person's telling them what they should eat or what they can order or, you know, it just seems like that person is in control in, in a really unhealthy way. Um, you know, if you're talking to the person face-to-face, if there's inconsistencies in their story or they're unable to answer questions, like really basic questions about where do you work or where do you live or, um, you know, you know, those kinds of things that you should be able to kind of answer. If you see signs of physical abuse, so, you know, especially for our healthcare providers, if they're, if you're seeing the same person coming in frequently for the same injuries or, you know, for something chronic or some kind of sexually transmitted disease, those are all kind of signs. Um, and I would say for parents, you know, if your youth are becoming secretive about who they're meeting, if they have new stuff that's appearing that you didn't buy them, um, those kinds of things, you need to be aware of where that's coming from. Unexplained changes in behavior or personality. I mean, some of that is normal for teenagers, certainly. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> you know, you were mentioning, like, if you're out at a restaurant and you see a much younger person with a much older person, you know, and if, if and they're, they're not their and dad. Saying, yes. <laughs> and they're yeah. not their dad. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's, that's definitely a sign, you know, and, and we see that a lot where the person will say, this is my uncle, or this is my brother, or this is my ride, or my sponsor, you know, in terms of labor trafficking. But, um, you know, I mean, trust your intuition, right? You don't want to assume and, and cause further harm to the person. So you certainly don't want to step in um, and say anything or call the police or anything like that, because that's definitely not going to <laughs> yeah. resolve the issue. We only have about five minutes left, and I want to make sure that we what you suggest people should do. And then I want to get to your toolbox of resources because you have quite a, quite a good toolbox there. I want to to, you to talk a little bit about that too. So what should someone do if they see you don't, don't call the police. What do you do if you see something? The best, the best thing to do is report it to the national human trafficking hotline. And that number is 888-3737-888. And they, You know, it's anonymous. You can call in. You can make a report online. um, But they have then connections to police, to law enforcement, and they will then, you know, and maybe there was another report made that you don't know about. So that, you know, just having, like, one place that everybody can go, and that way you're not putting that person in further harm. Um, Because you don't know the whole story, and you certainly don't want to cause further harm to that. And just some really good resources, I would say, if anyone listening is just wanting to know what to do next, the best way is to educate yourself, to really dispel those myths, to start learning about what human trafficking really looks like, really is. I think there's just so many stereotypes out there about what this looks like Mm -hmm. that are untrue. Mm -hmm. Um, So our website on the Arch Indy um, Anti-Human Trafficking Ministry, we have a toolkit that we have available, again, for parishes or individuals interested in this. Um, The U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops also has human trafficking resources on their website. The Polaris Project is a great organization that's doing amazing work around this. Um, The National Human Trafficking Hotline also is a great resource for prevention. Um, The Blue Campaign is another place to look. And locally, we have ITVAP, which is the Indiana Trafficking Victim Assistance Program. And so they also have a website that people can go look for assistance, look for trainings, um, look for different resources. 
And Love 146 is also another great resource. And with Love 146, the great thing about them is before um, Restored closed, we actually train providers across Indiana in the Not a Number curriculum. And that's a prevention curriculum aimed at youth ages 12 to 18 and really gets at these red flags, these vulnerabilities, and what to do, creating safety plans. Um, who do you talk to? And it's really peer-led. So it's peers talking to peers about what would you really do in this situation, not just an adult telling them you should do this which we know is probably not as effective. So what? So what's this been like for you personally to be a part of, of this um, task force, you know, since you've come, come from Restored and see now what, what's happening in the Archdiocese? What's it been like for you? I am just so excited that our Archdiocese is um, working on this issue and bringing awareness to this issue and, and just really making it um, an issue that we're bringing to light for our youth, I think this has been such a, you know, like Jim mentioned, he didn't know about this when he was, you know, growing up and such a prevalent issue now. And especially in this virtual world, it's only going to get worse. And so I'm just so excited that people are becoming aware of this. They're educating themselves and that the archdiocese is taking the lead and that we have this human trafficking ministry who can really advocate and lead in that way. So if you could give that phone number again for the national hotline, I guess it is, is it the national hotline? And then yep. give the Archdiocesan website one more time. Sure. So the National Human Trafficking Hotline is 888-3737-888. And they also have a website with some great resources. And then the Arch Indy Anti-Human Trafficking Ministry Toolkit can be found at archindy.org. So it's A-R-C-H indy.org dot org backslash trafficking. So archindy.org backslash trafficking. And we'll have a link on the podcast. So if you're listening to the show, you can go to the um, our Catholic Radio Indy.org website and you can get the, the podcast of the show and grab that link for yourself too. Um, our guest today has been Simona Rising. She is on the, the member of the Anti Human Trafficking Task Force for the Office of Social Concerns for Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. Thanks so much for being our guest today, Simona. Thank you for having me. And Happy New Year. You have been listening to Faith in Action, the program that looks at how people put their faith into action in their everyday lives. Faith in Action is a presentation of Catholic Radio Indy. You can hear this episode of Faith in Action again or any past episode at catholicradioindy.org. If you have a suggestion for a guest or topic for a future program, please call us at 317-870-8400 or email jim at catholicradioindy.org.